Okay, so we should be live now. Well, welcome uh, everyone to the first episode of a new show called The Burning Questions. And who better could I have for the first episode than my gurus themselves? Well, first of all, somebody who needs absolutely no introduction, but still I will attempt to make a small introduction. Michael Bolton. Uh, you know, consultant, tester, uh, amazing uh, musician. I must say that not not a lot of people know, but but he's definitely not a singer, but he plays a lot of good music, and most importantly, a very very extremely well read and knowledgeable person, as you can see from the books behind him, and uh, then. They're actually real. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and then the other guest also needs no introduction. It is uh, Somya Mukherjee, my go-to person for any question regarding what we call automation. And there, is, there are a lot of burning questions around automation today. So, we, so let's uh, get started. Uh, so welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. So first uh, thing that I wanted to know is, you know, today we are uh, celebrating International Testers Day. I do not know who coined this term, who started it, but uh, you know, I want to wish all the testers a very happy International Testers Day and congratulate everyone for saving the world with things that you are doing. <laughs> uh, I, I And uh, I want to, uh, first, go to Michael. Michael, you recently tested the Swiss Air website and, and posted uh, something. So uh, after testing that website and after looking at things for such a long time, what is your perspective on the current state of testing? Well, uh, testing's a mess. Uh, it's been a mess for a long time. Uh, it's likely to stay a mess until uh, things change. Um, I should hasten to add that I did not test uh, this you, Swiss Air you, website. I tried to use it, and you, I suppose you could say it tested me. Um, <laughs> it tested my, my patience, it tested my uh, ability to get a job done, and uh, um, it failed that test. Um, I think one of the reasons that testing is in a mess is because is precisely because people don't do what I did, which is I tried to use the damn thing, right? I tried to actually use the damn thing to interact with it, to experience it, to perform little experiments on it. And those little experiments revealed very quickly that there were apparently deeper problems than the one I was seeing. But uh, uh, one of the reasons that testing is in a mess is because testing is focused on demonstration, showing that the product can work, but a demonstration is not a test. A test is an experiment. A test is a challenge. A test is an investigation. And I, it suddenly occurs to me that I've been on this you know, rant for the better part of 20 years now. That, that testing is not simply showing that if we do this and this and this and this, we get this output. Testing is learning about the product. Testing is about discovering problems in it and discovering behaviors that are in some sense surprising to people who built it. It's about investigation. It's about uh, uh, experimenting, not about rote procedural stuff. And that's been true. Uh, th that problem has existed in testing since I got into the business back in what, into the testing business as such, about 1994 or so. And it, we're still mired in these uh, uh, false beliefs about testing. I am available for children's parties, by the way, um, if uh, anybody <laughs> needs entertainment or, you know, a, a good time. <laughs> 
thing. But I'm, I'm, I'm really sad to say testing's in a mess and it's going to stay in a mess until we as testers start to speak of it and uh, uh, perform it a lot more effectively and articulately. I just wanted to add a couple of more things here. Uh, for me, you know, it's a mindset that should be on everybody's, you know, lingo in, in, in your team, right? So people would say that it's testers' job to find out things, but I would say that testing or quality in general is, is everybody's responsibility. It's not a testers' thing. So, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's kind of a mindset which should be in everybody's Sure. Uh, and, well, I agree with that, Somya. But um, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, what does testing have to do with quality? It basically, when you, okay, so, okay, let me put this, um, put my perspective. It's an experience, right, that you would like to go ahead you know, and experience the product, right? How it is behaving, how it should work, right? Ultimately drives down towards the quality of the product because with experience, you would able to understand what kind of issues that product has. Maybe a tester, when he looks at the product, come up with a design issue, right? There are chances, like I, I get so many design challenges. I say, why this button is here? Probably the user experience is, why do you need a scroll in the tab, a card? There has to be a search for a card, right? So what I, what I understand is, and is like when you experience the product, when you understand the user mindset, you, it, it basically, goes towards the quality factor of the product. That's that's what my perspective is. I, I, I want to be careful though. How does it go to that? What what does what is the association, if you like, between testing and quality? Can you can you connect that for me? I'm okay. I'm trans I'm transpecting here by the way. Uh, no. uh transpecting is a uh a, a uh process it might be it might have been coined by by james i'm not sure but he's the one who introduced me to the idea which is i'm kind of borrowing your brain <laughs> to work out something in my own head that i want to get better at saying myself so hearing you uh, uh, say this is a, a means for us to try to to get sharper on on what we're saying so i got an idea in my head but I, I'm, I'm trying to hear yours first so, okay uh what is most important for a user? Are you most important for a user is that the expectation from the product that the user have should be met, right? Let's assume that I want to book a flight ticket. I should be able to book the flight ticket, right? What, what happens if you, if the user do not get that experience of booking the flight ticket correctly? The ultimate word, they will not say testing, they will say quality, okay? From the user perspective, they will always say the quality of the product is not great, okay? So how should, how will I connect to this is that as a tester, I need to understand the user mindset, how he wants or she wants to use the product, okay? And then translate it to quality because from the user side, they will never say testing. They will always say quality. It's a perspective that they have. Michael, good answer. Well, here's what I believe. Is that two terms actually? What, what I'd offer there is that testing does not improve the quality of the product. Testing allows us to get a, a bearing, an idea of what the quality of the product might be to some person who matters. Now, a lot of the time, it seems to me that testers are focused on 
something that they call the user experience, which I think they usually mean my experience, right, as testers. Uh, I'm, uh, I've been kind of um, skeptical about how accurately testers reflect actual user experience. Uh, I mean, when the tester is interacting with the product, getting experience with the product, I think it's great. I think it's really important. Um, but uh, I'm not convinced that testers are given enough exposure to actual users of products and to the wide range of people who might be users of the product and also to uh, other people who we don't usually think of as users, but who are in fact, in some sense, are users of the product. People like operations people, like support people, like um, um, uh, documentation people, like the bosses of the people who are using the product. Um, those are usually, it seems to me, kind of swept aside and the tester is not actually immersed in the user's world. Now, of, of course, for a um, an airline booking application like we started this conversation with, uh, there are certain very broad notions of what a, a, a user might be. You don't have to be involved in that world necessarily. But for, um, uh, for things like financial applications, and so on that are not necessarily customer, you know, outside customer facing. It seems to me really important for testers to immerse themselves in the worlds of the people who are going to be affected by the product one way or another. And I don't think we're getting that. I don't think we're, uh, I don't think the business takes that seriously sometimes, the, the significance and the importance of that. And I don't think testers ask for it often enough. That's my, observation based on, on years of, of watching. Um, but when testers do ask for that, when they do get it, when they, even if by proxy, you know, they, they go out to the web and they look at the way people are complaining about products or uh, um, uh, when they go to the customer support people and say, well, tell us what you're hearing about the product. That can so much more uh, uh, strongly, or that can, turn the testing to a much stronger appreciation of what the user experience is actually like and help us to focus on things that really cause problems for people. A lot of the things that the testers gripe about, oh, this button's not in the right place. You know, who says? And to a certain degree, who cares? And how do you know it's right um, or what's wrong? I think that if we're not careful, that can lead to a lot of fairly shallow testing. Um, but if we decide that we're going to act like sociologists and immerse ourselves, alienate ourselves from the developer's world and from the world of the development group and immerse ourselves in this other world and then estrange ourselves from it and put us back into the developer's world as sort of a, an emissary or a, a reporter of what these other worlds look like. We could be super powerful as testers. I don't see a lot of that happening and I wish it were. So on, from that, uh, I have a I have a follow up and, and I would like to have both of your perspectives on this. So when we are talking about, uh, you know, the term quality, now quality from my perspective can be different compared to your perspective. And uh, what is of good quality for me may be of mediocre, mediocre quality to you, depending on on what features you are using, depending on you know what you are expecting. And when we talk about user experience, uh, that that experience is also different from a person to person. So Michael, you spoke about you know uh, looking at the feedback that is coming, for example, the number of calls that are made to the support team and the kind of issues that are getting reported there. So don't you think product development teams should focus more on, on what's being required by the customer, that is the actual user need 
compared to rather than okay building their own uh, product and shipping it over because uh, i i want to uh, give this a little more context because recently and i was discussing this just before the call started i read an article which said that you know 85% of the ceos in american startups say that they want to believe they want to build the product and ship it to the customer as soon as possible and they can think about or worry about testing later and anyways the users will report issues to them so so what do you have have to say about that it makes sense if you're producing a stupid little social media application where it, you know all you're providing is a chat server but if there's value on the line if there's risk if the product has uh, uh, any role in harm loss, loss damage diminished value loss of money loss of opportunity loss of freedom loss of uh, um, uh, status loss of reputation then you might want to have a look at the product before you inflict it on an unsuspecting public and you might want to try some experiments on it to find out if your beliefs about the goodness of the product are valid supportable beliefs now if that doesn't matter then it doesn't matter if you test it first but i mean all you have to do is think well dear ceo who says you can ship it first how would you feel if this product surprised you in an unpleasant way and caused you to lose time money health safety you know it, 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 and the other there's another big lie by the way in that whole story and that is that users will report problems they won't <laughs> they won't they won't report problems and why not because the same ceos you think that testing is treated badly you should see what happened to support yeah <laughs> you know we've replaced support with untested chatbots yeah <laughs> i mean it, it it's really interesting to me because these ceos it seems the ceos that you're talking about i don't know whether it's 85 percent of them or, or 10 percent of them it doesn't matter very much but for ceos who say it's all right the customers will report problems later well does it even matter to you that they're experiencing problems first of all does that even matter to you and second what tells you that they're going to report problems what tells you that they're not just going to stop being customers or that they're going to swear at you every time you you use the product only you can't hear it because you cut off all sources of communication between the customer and your company like I said, children's parties, I'm available if you need entertainment, you know, a lighthearted songs and stories and so on and so forth. I, I can help you out with that. But it, there's a lot, I'm afraid there's a lot to be grumpy about in the in the, the worlds of uh, testing and of, of soccer development. Actually, I, I it, 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 Bridges is talking about the CEOs who said that, you know, they, the users would find out. It, it actually happened with me live, right? When when I was doing my consulting, I used to go to the startups and used to tell them that, you know, give me an opportunity to test your application. And used to always tell me that my users are going to test and they are going to report the issues. And I'm like, come on, like, you know, they will not use your product. They'll go to <laughs> they somebody will, else. They, they will probably take some more customers out of your app by even letting other people know that your app doesn't work. Right? So be serious. Right? Like for an example, you know, most most of the people, you know, I, I just recently uh, uh, looked at one of the app, and the app was swapping the the so the sort of trading app, right? So you have uh, a profit and uh, and you have one one so you have what how much you have invested how much has it's been uh, gone up and what's the profit or a loss right and typically 
around you know when the market would open within 15 minutes you would see that the numbers flips so the yeah. profit becomes how much you have invested and because of that you would get a minus huge loss right and like that people don't understand this right you you are testing a product it looks fine to you how about other factors that affects your product right like concurrency of users you know your your server capabilities to handle it what about yeah, latency right there's so many factors that can affect a product is just not functionality or the user right there's so many stuff in words yes. and i was like seriously like did you ever test your product between 9:15 and 9:30 yeah, when the market or, just opens. Yeah. Or, or, you know, simulate that. And uh, that's one powerful way of using tools that is sometimes uh, used, but the, the, uh, the tool vendors don't talk about it that much. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it use tools to pump zillions of transactions through your uh applicate now you're going to have to model it because typically in a um uh, a testing context we we might not it's not always the case but we might not have access to the platform on which the actual product will be running but we can certainly make uh, uh observations and extrapolations about what might happen in public there's a catch and the catch is that uh performance degradation is nonlinear almost always it's not it, you know yeah. it, it, um, it when performance degrades it, it goes eh, <clears throat> like that <laughs> and drops, drops straight down so uh, uh, one thing we have to be careful of when we're analyzing performance results is uh, the notion that in the real production environment the uh, amount of traffic that we get uh, is going to uh, cause our stuff to behave very differently right. at very uh, a specific and unknown to us points. <laughs> so we got to be careful about that stuff. Like for, for an example, you know, you will hear this term from the developers, right? I found a racing condition in my app. Now, nobody knows what the racing condition is. Right? So you need to do a lot of experimentation in order to understand the behavior of the product, which may lead you to that racing condition and just not like that. So, yeah. So uh, nobody understands what a racing condition is. Uh, Somya, you better tell us. What is a racing condition? So what happens is like, you know, so when, when you send a lot of traffic to the server, right? and server is multi-threading you're using multi-threading in the background right each thread talks and overwrites the data on different threads so for example if there are hundreds of threads working parallel right and each other is doing some work they they tend to write the data on each other's thread that's the racing condition so oh, that's interesting i i understood race condition as something where process a uh is waiting for process b uh process a says ready when you are process a is waiting for process or process b is waiting for process a <laughs> process b says ready when you are and each process each interdependent process is uh locked sometimes people call it a deadly embrace right that um neither one can go until the other one goes uh so it, it's interesting it, what you're talking about Sonia, it, it's a, a form of um uh corruption uh that's it, 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 race conditions could trigger them i suppose uh right. the way i understand race conditions yeah it would trigger the race condition because you know when you tend to write each other's the data in different threads right it becomes Right. Yeah, I, I, I think I think what you're talking about 
I would have understood as a, a resource contention or data contention. But here's but here's the good thing about this. The good thing about all this is when we are discussing, talking about what we're doing, trying to refine what we mean by what we say, my strong belief back to years and years of experience is that we get better at it. That's why it's good to have talks like this because we can sort out what we understand about things and uh, uh, come up with deeper models, richer models, more specific, more uh, uh, clearly expressed uh, notions of what can go wrong, uh, uh, how we might uh, uh, note that and discover that and so on. So uh, conversations like this are wonderful for that. Well, uh, thank you for that. But I want to go to the next burning question that I have. And that is, can you teach me automation? <laughs> Both of you. I thought the question so, was, can you teach me how to do automation? Yeah. Right? Was that, yeah. that was a question. Uh, hello. Can you teach me how to? Yeah. We were talking before. We were talking before we had online. <laughs> the question that came up: uh, Can you teach me how to do automation? Do automation. How to do automation? Go ahead, from you. You first. All right. So <clears throat> my philosophy is something a uh, little different. You know, uh, what I understand. I know if I want to teach somebody automation, uh, first I wanted to understand that what what is this, what is that you are doing in the product? Okay. Uh, you're testing the product how many times do you want to test it right for an example there is there is a build that has happened now you would test the product right then there is another build that would come and you would like to experience the same product again right you tend to do as much time testing on the product and it's a repeatable task right so when a task is repeatable right and that you have to do it again and again you could i i basically teach them the application of automation rather than taking them to the tools so if you see that your process is repeatable you need to do it again and again and again and again you basically tend to put automation in place right and automation is as i mentioned that you know uh uh, a simple formula in uh, an Excel file is is automation, right? Uh, if I, I want to add two columns and I put a sum formula, internally it is automating, taking two variables and summing it up. Right? So to me, repeatability is one of the factor where I would see if I would like to do automation. Second is, if I automate, Okay, uh, and, and what I'm trying to teach you guys is probably why I should do automation, right? If if something I create and I if I can use it uh, again and again, okay, that's the reusability of the piece of thing that I've written. I would term it as you know I would I would go and do automation. So if it is repeatable process, if it is reusable. If there is reusability, I would do automation. Okay. Here's my answer. Uh, nobody does automation. <laughs> by, by definition, automation is something that's done by a machine, right? What I would, if somebody were to ask me, can you teach me how to do automation? <laughs> The first thing I would go, that the first thing I would do is I would fix the question. This is a problem with burning questions. Some questions are, are burning in the sense that they're on fire and, and they need to be put out. The problem in the question needs to be addressed. So the problem is we don't, first of all, we don't do automation. We use tools and uh, sometimes we write code. Sometimes we write code in order to create our own tools. Now, 
the motivation for using tools or for writing code or for writing a particular kind of uh, code that, that we would call an automated check, the motivation for that is where we got to start, first of all. And it's not just about repeatability. It's about extending our capacity as human beings to get a job done. So I might write some code that I'm only ever going to use once to perform some calculation. And I, as Somi, I really like the, the point that you've made that using a formula in Excel is automation just as much as any other form of automation. It's getting a machine to do something for us, getting a machine to sum a, a row of columns all you're doing is that humble little skill of using the equals at sum uh, or equals sum function in Excel and by gum, you're using automation. Congratulations, well done. That's great. It's, a, and it, it's very useful, it seems to me, for testers to understand the power of tools like Excel, uh, which is sometimes mimicked by Google Sheets, but not as well. Um, but anyway, um, I might write a bit of code in order to generate some data. I might uh, write some code to perturb the data that I've generated. Uh, I might write some code to uh, help me analyze uh, the contents of the JSON or the contents of lots of JSONs. Uh, and I might only do that the once and never go back to it. So let's unpack the question Can you teach me? how to use tools in order to aid my testing? Or can you teach me how to write code in order to aid my testing? And uh, can you uh, help me uh, write code or use tools in order to check output to see if the output that we get from this function is consistent with something specified and presumably desirable, or maybe even something <laughs> that is uh, uh, consistent with something not desirable. So we can probe that uh, for errors and such. Notice I was able to take those three things and get rid of the word automation, right? We, it, it, what bugs me about testing these days is uh, automation. It's almost automation. It's almost as automation that people have automation, this kind of automation problem where automation, they have to automation, say automation every single sentence they utter. It drives me bananas. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, tools are wonderful things, absolutely wonderful things. But uh, uh, this sort of, there's a, a trend these days to equate automation and testing sometimes in our discourse. You know, uh, how am I going to automate this uh, piece of software? Well, wait a minute. It, you don't have to automate that piece of software if your goal is to test it. Uh, using tools, using automation might help you to test it in some sense, but uh, it's really uh, uh, putting the... Um, <laughs> It's really putting the uh, uh, Ferrari before the horse, you know. Uh, it's it's the question is is starting in the wrong place. It seems to me, but I can I can help people learn how to test, and in doing that, I can help them point out. Oh, here's a way in which your tools, in which a tool or a bit of code might increase your testing superpowers that might allow you to probe into stuff that you uh, wouldn't be able to probe into, considering the volume of data, the, the, the scope of the log files, the, uh, uh, the, the things that are hidden below the surface of the program that you can get at with code. But it, 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 so often, automation is used to uh, uh, just describe automated checks and that's all we do as testers we just make sure that this output matches or this that matches yeah this output matches this specified result and we're done but that takes sometimes an immense amount of time especially when we do it at the GUI level 
And it's fiddly and it's challenging. It's easier and, and uh, I think more on point at lower levels of the product, at the interface, the, the application programming interface level or at the unit level. Why not point tools to those interfaces and then do our testing as though people <coughs> were then do some other testing, different testing, as though people were going to be using this product from the human interface and use human knowledge, observation, uh, 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 analytical ca uh, capabilities, right? The, the stuff that we're built with as human beings to, to ask ourselves, all right, is there a problem here? And maybe in order to get to a certain place in the application or to understand things that are going on invisibly behind the screen, use tools to help us with that. There is there is one problem, Michael, here. Okay, when you go lower level, right? Let's assume that UE level is fiddly, uh, as you said, it's correct. But let's assume that you are pointing it to an API and you want to basically test the APIs first. One of the things that I always hear this is that, hey, you found out an issue at my interface, but it gets stopped from the UI. So why don't you go and check in the UI? How would you answer that? It, I, I didn't, I, there's a, a word I missed in there. I, I, I see the problem at the interface level, but it gets what? It gets blocked at the GUI level because I would put a validation check on the GUI, which will not pass that value to the service or the interface. Oh, well, that seems to me that's like an invitation for hackers to go in behind the GUI and uh, do exactly, I mean, it's really easy to, to see a lot of the time uh, where those interfaces are by looking at the dev tools in Chrome and, and uh, the hackers will do that. So you've got a security risk there, that's one thing. But the other thing is if you have a preventable, <coughs> um, now, of course, it, let me put an important caveat on this. It's not my business to tell developers and designers and managers how to do this stuff. It is my job to shine light on risk, right? Right. So that's, I, I mean, anytime I report a bug, I'm always prepared for the idea that they're going to say, no, that's not important enough to me to, to address or to fix or to change. No problem. Nobody as a tester, when I'm a program manager, it's a different deal. But when I'm a tester, nobody has to do what I say. I don't care if they do what I say. It's their job. They're being paid the big bucks. They're being paid to manage the project. They're being paid to build the product. They're being paid to design the product. That's their job. I do want to be heard, right? But if they've heard me and they've said, we don't think that's a problem, I'll say, that's fine. I will also advise them that it's going to make my testing more difficult, more time consuming because of the fiddliness that we, we both agree is a, a factor in, in uh, automated GUI checking. It's going to, it's simply going to take uh, uh, more time. It's going to be more expensive. Uh, and that expense expressed mostly in terms of time, it seems to me, uh, time for development and time for maintenance will mean that there will be important bugs that I miss. Now, one of the great lies going around the, the business these days is that automation will automatically give more te or testers more time to do exploratory work. <laughs> and that is just absolute bullshit. It's bullshit. Automation reduces many kinds of costs, certain kinds of costs, and increases others profoundly. Let's not lose track of that. Uh, you know, it's like the uh, the automated check giveth and the maintenance of it taketh away. You know, it, it, that's 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 a fact. And uh, on top of that. There's also this a, a thing that I keep hearing. We have a hundred thousand automated checks on every, you know, we run those on every build. Really? So when was the last time you reviewed any particular one of those checks? Assume there's five testers in the group. Uh, each tester, therefore, 
uh, if you want to keep make sure they're relevant, each tester must review 20,000 checks a year. Do the math. How many checks is that per day that the tester must review if we're going to look at these things and, and, and decide that they're not either missing important uh, uh, bugs and falsely providing a, a sort of false reassurance, or they're even relevant at all, even necessary at all. That's but Michael, I, I would slightly disagree here. Okay? When I automate the process, right? It actually gives my users who are testing from the UI perspective, right? Gives more time to do their actual validations that they want to do. Like for yeah. example, they need not to worry about those hundred checks, you know, which I've automated, but they may find different ways to test the product because of my automated test. Well, uh, uh you are not, first of all, you're not automating the testing. You're automating checks of certain values. Yeah. And then my, my other uh, uh, reply to that is, okay, so uh, let's assume that uh, checking one's work is important. We can agree on that. Can you come again? Sorry. Yeah, uh, checking one's work is important. We can agree then, on that. Okay. But how, is it, how is it that the developers are not being given the time and the mandate to do that? And I think part of the reason for it is that people believe uh, falsely that, uh, oh, it's okay. Uh, the testers can, can do that. But I don't want testers to be doing that. I want testers to be doing deep testing. Shallow checks, it seems to me, is something that uh, uh, Jeff Frederick, who's one of the, the one of the agilists I respect most, put it really nicely at a conference in India one time. And I, I saw him speak, and I thought it was just wonderful. He said, "Look, nobody should ask programmers to guarantee that this code does what it's supposed to do and doesn't do what it's not supposed to do in every case. Nobody should ask that. That's not reasonable." But he says, it does seem to me that programmers should be able to give a warrant, at least it does this. And I've checked this, and I've checked it diligently. I'm adding the checked it diligently part. He didn't, he didn't say that exactly at the time. But, I mean, uh, the way for testers to contribute to that, rather than saying, okay, I'll take care of all writing all the code for the automated checks, because the testers, by and large, not always... But testers are usually hired young. They're not hired for their programming skills. They're not hired for uh, uh, having a great depth in, in programming. And they're not building the product. The best thing I think that testers can do in that circumstance is to collaborate with the developers and to say, all right, here's the stuff that's going to take a lot less time and a lot less effort for you to include in your discipline of, of building the product. And I, as the tester, will go to management with you and support you in your story about how important that is. Right. Now, as an older guy, I can do that. As a younger guy, it's a lot harder. And it, yeah. it, it must be, my God, it must be so much harder for a younger woman to do that because of the ways that women are monstrously and systematically uh, 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 downgraded socially in this business. So what I generally do, Michael, is you know, in, in my projects, I, I generally first talk to the users. I don't talk to the developers or anybody else. I go to the users and ask them, what exactly are you looking at in this product? Okay, They will tell me, okay, I need X, Y, Z, P, Q, R, whatever. I include them into the checks, the automated checks. And then I go to the developer and say that, okay, here I have written something, okay, which is obviously aiding my users, and you can also leverage this while you are developing. So if you have you are developing and you want to quickly check if these checks, the mandatory check, should work, or this is the minimum amount of check should work, you can use my automated test and verify that. 
Yeah, well, that, I mean, that that could be uh, that could be handy. I I just resist the presumption that uh, uh, output checking is something that should start with the tester. I I think mm -hmm. that our our management uh, uh, structures are are messed up on that issue, and it it, it comes from years and years and years and years of uh, uh, test scripting not necessarily done for machinery to uh, uh to perform but for humans to perform uh became equated with 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 testing itself and that's just it, it's it, it's a stupid way to think about it i'm afraid that testing okay. is about challenging the product it's not it, it, output checking is one of the smallest and and most trivial things about testing, and relatively speaking, it's the easy part. That Excellent. collaboration that you're talking about with the the uh, with the end users, I, I would argue that uh, it's not an either or thing uh, either. It, it's certainly the business analysts and the uh, or requirements people and the designers. I want them involved in in all this too, in in developing my mental models for the product. But the idea that that gets rendered down to automated checks as a first principle or scripted checks for a human test to perform as the first thing we should be doing, I think that's silly. Um, for the developers, it makes a lot more sense. For, for testers, not very much. Our, our, our list of things should not be things to be checked, but risks to be investigated. That's my belief anyway. Interesting uh, reactions there to that question. Well, uh, so continuing this a little more. Now, there is a trend that is going on, and in Somia, I'm sure you get a lot of these where testers keep coming and telling you that, you know, I want to move from manual testing to automation. Okay. I need some guidance. I want to start doing. Now that's more or less driven by the unfair salary structures that we have. And obviously automation testers are getting paid much more than those who do not use any tools. So Swami, what is your take on this entire approach in the industry plus in the minds of the testers? First of all, I tell them that there is nothing called as manual testing. It's just testing. And uh, yeah, it's just testing, right? It's second, what I do is I, I, I make sure that they feel good about them themselves. Okay. Somebody who knows programming, right, can easily become an automation tester these days, right? But they would not know the nitty gritties of testing, right? So the second thing that I generally do with people is that, hey, you know testing, which is more important in the process rather than you knowing a tool. The third thing which I generally do with the folks is there are multiple tools and there are many people in the industry we talk about these tools what you should do to educate yourself better that is because these days there is too much information when we started there was no information at all these days there are a lot of information on the internet and and people who would probably want to learn tools and coding so they are what they are essentially asking is how can i program right mm. They, they are not asking that teach me automation testing. They, they would, they, if they know how to program and the underlying tool, they can apply their testing brains and can automate that process, right? So these are certain things which I start with the folks to basically make them feel good. And then I go through, I just take a dummy, you know, application, just a Google search, right? And first, go through a list of checks that probably 
first of all, I need to understand whether they understand testing or not, right? And then I show them that, okay, how you can code now of the checks that you wanted to do, right? So that's a step-by-step -step process. I basically follow with the folks who say that they want to do transition. There is nothing called like that, right? A developer can become, I was a developer, I went to testing. I can again go back and do programming, right? Who stops me to do things? So, so, uh, so Michael, I, I just want to ask you, now there is also a tendency of a lot of testers wanting to go ahead and become product owners and scrum masters and and business analysts. And then I ask them, the uh, response that I get is that, oh, testing does not have much of a scope in future. I'm looking for something which has scope. So can you tell me how do I move to DevOps? Because I hear a lot of DevOps. Or I want to go towards product ownership or uh, you know become a Scrum Master because Agile is there, which is growing and growing. So I want to transition from testing. So my question back to them is, okay, tell me what is wrong with testing first? What have you understood? Why do you think that testing is soon going to have a doomsday? And after that day, there is no testing that is going to be done. And often to that question, I do not get any response. Instead, people go to somebody else and ask the same question. Okay, so so I want to ask you this question. Okay, why is this thought process going on? What is going on with people? And, and what would be your advice to somebody who comes to you with this kind of a question? People act on what their incentives are, right? What, what they're, uh, how they're rewarded. Right. And there's a feedback loop. And I'm sorry to say this. It, it always pains me to say this. It's been paining me to say this for 25 years or so, still painful. But let's face it, most testers aren't very good. <laughs> it's, it's sad. But it's explicable. It's completely explicable that they're not very good because they're hired as novices. They're not given training. They're not given an appreciation of what testing uh, uh, is, uh, what it isn't, what it could be. It's not treated as something for experienced people. It's it's something that's for freshers, as you might say in in uh, in India. There's a feedback loop in place because the standards for testing are so low, then testers uh, aspire to what is a low standard. And because they aspire to a low standard, then they, uh, uh, the standards stay low. Most employers, it seems to me, have uh, either rarely or never seen really, really good testing. So a lot of this has to come from us. Rather than thinking of ourselves as uh, uh, aspiring, well, let, let's look at the automation tester thing first. I don't even know what that means. Does that mean somebody who writes automated checks? Okay, but that is a really, really impoverished way of thinking about how we can use tools in our analysis of the product. Uh, let's use tools to extend, accelerate, intensify, enable, uh, uh, enhance our capacity to understand what's going on in the product. And in particular, because this gets ignored all the time, what's going on in the data uh, that, the project is, that the product is generating, uh, either in terms of output or in terms of, of uh, log files and things about the product. Let's use it to probe the product. People want to become uh, 
so-called automation testers, what they're really asking is uh, how, it, you know, I, I think you're probably right. How can I get paid more? But here's a way I think we could get paid way, way better as a whole craft. And that is to stop automating the useless shit because much of what is getting automated is stuff. Oh, well, we don't want people to have to do this because, you know, it's not very high value. Each observation that's being made by this, uh, you know, we could get a machine to do that. Well, yeah, but let's pause and ask the question whether it's even worth it for the machine to do it, whether it's even <laughs> worth it to write code to do that. Let's look instead at how can we apply tools to be more powerful analysts, to be more powerful testers, uh, to be more powerful investigators. Really what the question is, is not how can I move from uh, uh, manual testing to automated testing. I agree with Sony, Sony absolutely right. There's no, you're, you're not a manual tester. You're not an automated tester. You're not an automation tester. You're a tester. What they're really asking is how can I improve my skills? I would say, well, you know what? If you're even considering learning to code, if you're even considering that, just go ahead and do it. Learn how to write yeah. programs. But do so with the mindset, not how am, uh, how am I going to do this to, to uh, write automated checks? Because that's boring. And it does, uh, pretty boring. Uh, the, cause it's all about, you know, uh, how do I identify this, you know, uh, uh, this, uh, element on a page without a locator on it, you know, that sort of stuff is like yawn. Oh my God. <laughs> it, first of all, report a bug if it doesn't have an ID on it, right? If the element doesn't have a, a an ID on it, then just report a, a, a testability bug and move on. Um, don't spend time in X path hell if you can possibly avoid it. But far more importantly, uh, how can we use tools to probe the product deeply? And that requires us, as Somi pointed out, that requires us to learn how to test first yeah. and foremost. So absolutely right. Let's use that, it, it, apply that to our testing skills first and foremost. I think if we did that, we wouldn't have quite so many testers racing away to be program managers or product managers or, or uh, uh, DevOps people somehow or other. There is, in this business, inevitably prestige associated with code because the people who write the code, the people who write uh, uh, software, those are the people who get uh, uh, respect and, and credit in this business because they're producing something that is tangible and visible. But for testers, what, one of the things we got to get good at is to say, well, you know what? Uh, um, <laughs> if uh, everything works out, uh, customers will never see any of our work, never see any of our work because we were so good at alerting developers and managers to problems that uh, uh, got squashed before the product hit production. Now, uh, uh, let's by all means, if you're even thinking of learning how to code, do it. But if you're not, there are lots of other testing skills that you can contribute to the uh, analysis, critical thinking, risk analysis of the product that will serve you in good stead, such that people will look to you and say, dang, we wouldn't have been aware of that problem without this person helping us out. If you need code written, usually the problem is not a lack of people capable of writing code around the project. Usually the problem is nobody even thought to uh, uh, produce the code to do that. You can learn how to do that from a, a developer or you can be charming uh, and pragmatic, and you can help management and the developers to understand the power of the developer taking a little bit of time to help you develop a, a, a bit of code or, or a, a tool that you might need in order to analyze the product more deeply. And Somia, when you talked about going back to the developer with that, uh, that's a, a, 
I think a, a, an even more powerful instance of that, which is to say to the developer, listen, I'm not that great at writing code. <laughs> I wasn't hired as a programmer. Uh, and maybe you could help me learn how to write code to do this. But in the meantime, it might be a really useful thing for me and for you to have this bit of code that would help us to understand our product better, help us to understand risk better, help us to understand problems better. And that's, if we learn to be persuasive about that, if we learn to help management and developers see the cost, the low cost of that and the high value of it, we might be a lot better off. There is there is one more thing which, are, which, which I generally ask them, right? You know, uh, when they come to me and say that automation, right? Then I start asking, you know, a couple of things, right? Because there are different terms of in automation, right? Performance also comes in automation, right? Security testing also, right? With, with different tools, right? Wherever there's tools, there's automation. But to my surprise, right? They, they want to write the code, but they don't know the spectrum of automation, right? They don't know what's functional, right? What's API, you know, can you test interface? do you do your product as apis can you test them right can can you basically add checks to it have you ever opened a website on a browser and checked the latency or some uh, 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 let's assume that a grid is taking so much time you know so did you go to your developer tools and and watch out what are the files that are being downloaded, what's not getting downloaded, how much is the latency, right? What is the what is the time? So so spectrum is one of the things that you know I want the young testers to go and understand, right? So it's automation is it's a huge set. It's just not functional. There are various other aspects of the product that that we need to also understand. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, 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 you know, it, it's a funny thing because it, let's think way back in the early, you know, in the earlier days of testing, when I first came into the business, <clears throat> there were two kinds of testers. <laughs> one, were, one were the supporting testers that got recruited to <coughs> help. We got people from uh, a customer service uh, sometimes to help us out in, in the, you know, we had an evening project one night, we bought pizza for the customer service people and we got them to help test. But our test manager made a rare mistake. He was a great test manager, but he made this mistake. He gave the customer service people scripts. Now preparing scripts and developing scripts like that, that's, a, uh, that's not a cheap process. It's not a trivial process. It takes time and it's expensive. Um, it uh, also often fails to address a particular problem, drives testers into a particular focus. But, you know, uh, what and what they found with that, by the way, was that the uh, customer service people who were following scripts tended not to find problems because in order to develop the script, you have to go through the process and get to the end of the, of the process successfully. Uh, uh, else you find a a bug and you revise the script. And so it once again, it, it turns into demonstration. All right, so that's expensive and time consuming. How about we do this? How about we develop some code that would help us check those outputs in the product? And then people started to realize, whoa, well, that's expensive too, because now we need, you know, we can do this really quickly, but now we need, uh, uh, people who are capable of writing that code. So that's expensive too. And now we've got these no code tools that come along and say, we, we don't, you know, uh, uh, the scripting was too expensive. The developers were too expensive. And uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to get some no code thing. Even the code now is being dismissed as uh, uh, something is too expensive. Uh <laughs> I one time quipped that we don't have no code testing tools. We have no testing code tools. Yes. <laughs> We've actually and, it, you know, it's just, it, it, the notion of testing itself has been so watered down by the idea that testing equals output checking. 
it, it it's just it's uh, frustrating for testing to be reduced to that all the way along. Um, but it just you know consider <coughs> using tools to flag particular transactions or particular data members or 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 objects. Uh, that you want to examine more deeply, right? Use tools to help you select and refine uh, those things from a much larger uh, base of data. Uh, use tools in order to alert you when some particular condition is met that is not necessarily uh, an output check. James and I, James Bach and I have started to refer to this as automated flagging where we go through a, a, a set of logs or a set of transactions or a whole bunch of data on a site and flag the stuff that's interesting to look at because it's got something inconsistent or weird or risky about it that's not necessarily, uh, uh, we, we don't know that there's a bug there yet or we wouldn't know that there's a bug yet, uh, but we, it, it has a potential to be interesting. So we wanna flag that one for special attention. It seems to me that's a, a, a use of tools that people almost never talk about. And yet it's a fantastic thing to allow you to focus your attention on certain kinds of risks. And it's the interaction between the interplay between doing interactive testing versus unattended testing. Doing experiential testing where uh, uh, what we're doing is is a, a more naturalistic. It, it's focused on the... Um, uh, the experience of some contemplated user versus testing that is in one sense instrumented where users wouldn't use these tools to get at the product and uh, in another sense, uh, artificial, not naturalistic. People refer to the former, the experiential testing is manual testing sometimes. And that uh, it's such a, a an unhelpful and we now believe toxic way of talking about it. If your testing is mediated, that is, it, it, there's some tool intervening between you and the the contemplated user's experience, you are going to miss things that the contemplated user would see. But also, if your experiments are not naturalistic, not particularly naturalistic. No, the, you know, the no user would do that kind of, of uh, experiment. That's still really valuable. I don't care whether no user would ever do that. Thousands of users acting at the same time might converge on, on doing that because what we're doing here is not something that any single user would do. It's doing something that, that a, a collection of users would do or, or something would happen under uh, realistic environments that no single user would do. So that's an experiment that's not naturalistic in the sense that, that it pertains to the user's experience, but it's a really important kind of test to do. And that test might require a whole bunch of interaction to learn about what we want to uh, 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 try to figure out about the product and its behavior. So let's drop this stupid manual automated thing. I'll, I'll say it one more time. There's no automated researchers and there's no manual researchers. There's no automated journalists and there's no manual journalists. There's no uh, uh, automated designers and manual designers. All these people use tools. It's normal. Uh, when a, uh, a journalist uses a macro in order to put in a, a string of text that, that he or she repeats, <clears throat> that doesn't turn them into an automated journalist, for heaven's sake, you know. Let's just drop the, this distinction. And Sonia, it, when you say there's no manual testing and no automated testing, I'm with you all the way. I'm, I'm your, your biggest supporter in that. Uh, uh, of course. Okay. Uh, well, Michael, you've actually led me to the next set of questions that I have. And, uh, you know, you mentioned about low code and no code. And, and these days, the market is full of such tools who are trying to go left, right, and center, trying to say things which are 
which actually do not make sense most of the time because somewhere i even read oh use this tool and uh, convert your manual testers into automation testers without any training or without any guidance or uh, you know stuff like that and uh, you know anybody can test now <laughs> anybody can test now use the low code no code tools so with so much going on with these tools what is your take because i have seen uh, you michael you put out a uh, few experience reports based on your experiments with some of these tools and so may you uh, i believe built one such tool long time ago uh, many years ago so gentlemen uh, what's your take if these tools are so great ask yourself this question go to my website have a, a, a do a search on mabel m a b l have a search on Catalan. Mm -hmm. Have a look at my experience report, just installing these tools and trying to get them to check something perfectly simple. And then ask yourself this, how can companies that produce these tools produce such terribly uh, uh, managed projects themselves? Each of those two tools had uh, uh, 20 or more uh, uh, easy to find bugs in them. The conclusion is one of, one of two conclusions and neither one of them are a happy conclusion. One of them is these tools don't use, or these companies don't use their own tools to test their software. That's a sort of disturbing conclusion. But an even more disturbing conclusion is these companies do use their tools to test their software, and these are the bugs that they have decided not to fix or the bugs that they've just missed altogether. Look, there's no short in any domain, medicine, uh, politics, and software testing, there's no shortage of charlatans who want to sell you a magic wand or uh, a magic pill or magic beans that will uh, uh, solve your problem. Sorry, lots of problems require actual human interaction with an observation of the product. Uh, uh, some tools and, and some approaches to learning things about our product require us to do actual work I would love, sincerely love, for testers as a community to rise up against these tool vendors and not say, are we going to lose our jobs? Instead to say, shit, no, we're not going to lose our jobs. And here's why. Your tools don't work. Why do we not have more testers uh, doing that? And I think, once again, it goes back to the idea that testers are mostly junior people who do not uh, uh, have not yet earned the respect of their uh, development and management colleagues, and we need to foster that. We need to develop uh, that. Our our we old people need to help uh, 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 testers not be safe in their jobs, but be strong in their jobs. Because if they're good at their jobs, then that safety will come along. Soumya, what is your take? So, I'll probably tell you a story, okay, why I created this tool, okay? So, I created a no-code, low-code tool way long back in 2016, 2015, 2016. It was predominantly the second tool which was there in the market. And I will tell you the mindset behind me, you know, using this tool. So, my company was very young. We, we, we started very, very new. We were three, four years into the business. We used to hire a lot of young crowd, okay? Who, who used to, you know, what, how, how do I like work with those young crowd is I, I used to train them on testing first, okay? And then deploy them. It's just not that you come and you, I, this is the product you go and test it. You there, you should know the basics first before you actually Put your hands down to your uh, to the application. Now, 
why I have to create that tool is basically, I always wanted to do automation because you know I don't want to basically want my people to do repeatable tasks or checks. So what, and I do not want them to write code because you know that every individual who would write the code would write the code in a very, very different way, right? If somebody uses an if condition, the other would one use would use the which condition, right? So there is no consistency in the code that would ever happen, right? So uh, wait, 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 why not though? I mean, are these people being managed? Are, are is their code being reviewed? Yeah, their their code would be reviewed. Okay, but. So we need to cut down the cycle time, Michael. Okay. So these are young developers, right? These are just freshers come out of the college, right? Uh, reviewing of code would take a lot of time. So Compared to what? I'm sorry. Compared to what? Compared to what? time. Compared to what? Compared to deliver the product. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, sure. Uh, but you know what? Uh, um... Uh, training your child to uh, be polite takes a lot of time too, but it confers enormous benefits on that child to be a polite member of society, right? Uh, um, so yes, uh, it does take a lot of time to train young testers. It does take a lot of time to train young programmers. But first of all, it doesn't take half as much time as anybody uh, believes, in my view, uh, because we don't teach them. <laughs> if we actually did try to teach them, and if we gave them uh, uh, some freedom and responsibility to learn things um, and provide them with feedback, provide them with close supervision at first and give them increasing responsibility to do more and more challenging stuff, they'd learn a lot more quickly than <clears throat> sending them to classes that enable them to pass certification exams, for instance. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, but actually training and, and uh, that, that review stuff, you say, well, okay, it would take a lot of time to do that. Well, yeah, but you know what? Uh, at first, but people learn. In review, they learn. They learn how to write uh, 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 better code. They learn how to accept and even uh, embrace the idea of review and to solicit it, to ask for it. Well, those make for those sorts of things make for really powerful testers, smart testers, good testers. So I don't think we should just throw our hands up and say everybody would do it differently. Well, let's look into why they do it differently, why they made the choices they did, and if it was a good choice praise them for it and if it was a eh, maybe not so good choice for it help them understand how to make better choices that makes for powerful testers but but to say uh you know what we're, we're just gonna let a machine write your code for you that's not gonna so, help in the michael, long run. michael the truth is everybody wants to deliver their product faster right uh but that's not all don't they want to deliver a good product faster? So, so there's a price to pay for that, which is yes. to be a little more prudent. Correct. So, okay. So the idea here was that, you know, the young people would also write the, the automated checks. I do not want, I want to follow them a process. Okay. And I wrote a tool which will help them to create that process. Okay. So it, it and it was just, an acceptance driven testing tool it's just a check that my user wants to put and you can basically do that in the tool second the issues that we get in automation is mostly around objects so i wanted to solve a critical problem here wherein the tool would basically the tool will basically <laughs> That, that's commentary. Uh, um, that's feedback. Uh, that's uh, a support. It sounds like good. <laughs> She's cheering so me up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Go, daddy. Go, daddy. <laughs> so that uh, you know, I I want to solve that problem because you know most of the time you know a, a young company goes to a client 
asking them for a work and they say that okay i want to show me how you can how how much time you will take to test this product and i want this in two weeks so i want to basically you know add some kind of a tool in my product which could ac actually solve those issues of you know identification of the uh, objects because that is the damn challenging thing in any of the tool and if you solve that then you can pro put your steps that you want to perform on the product okay and that would basically drive well i, I you know i understand the uh, the desire there but it seems to me a really good solution to the wrong problem and and the 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 problem it seems to me if we're really really interested in getting machinery to drive our products then it would seem to me a really, really good idea, a really great idea to go to the programmers who are building it and say, look, this is a requirement. I know it's not fun. I know you don't like it. But when you're putting an element on a web page somewhere, it's got to have an ID on it. It's going to make things so much easier for the testers. And by the way, we have a tool which will automatically check which elements don't have an ID on them. Uh, because apart from everything else, this is an accessibility issue too, right? Uh, if, if objects don't have IDs on them, screen readers for uh, uh, people who need those aren't uh, uh, going to be, uh, or the screen readers are going to miss stuff that's really important. So we can use tools, but let's use them further back up the process to say to the uh, uh, developers, if we're going to have automated checks, let's make it easy to do that. So putting an ID into the code as you develop it is something that is A, checkable, right? You can, here's a little tool that you can run that will notice when you haven't done that. And it's going to create cost savings, immense cost savings for us later on. So I understand, Somia, the, the problem that you're trying to address, and it is a big problem, no question about it. Um, it's, but it, as I say, it seems to me a really good solution to uh, a problem that is addressable uh, uh, earlier on by requiring developers, and I would also say, giving the developers time and um, accommodation for doing their work in a disciplined way. And it, so much of what passes for testing these days is an attempt to patch over that problem. Uh, basically to um, uh, help and accelerate the imprudent release of uh, uh, shabbily tested software. Yeah. And so, shabbily developed software too. So the idea was never to take out test testers out of the way, right? Of course. It is just like accelerating your testing, okay, with a set of tools. So that was the idea. Second, I made this tool not for the testers, but to the developers. So for an example, they want to basically, they have written a functionality and they want to basically, you know, test it, right? So one way to do it is that they, they can take their mouse, their keyboard, do whatever they want or add that those steps into the tool and it will start automatically check checking that functionality so i wanted to i wanted the developers to use this tool so that they can use it for their unit testing that could be a good thing how does it tell the difference between problem and no problem okay so obviously you know what i what i believe is that for an example as i mentioned in the flight booking uh, example right yeah. if i'm booking a flight i should get a pnr right i should get i should get a pnr number or i should get a id which says that okay this is your ticket number okay i should get i should get a pdf ticket or an whatever format ticket right I should be able to select my seat. So these are certain things that the product would need, right? So what they would do is they will feed this into the tool. So what they would do, they will select the object. They will tell what is the step. Okay, what is the event that they have to do? 
okay like for an example they want to basically do an assert or a click or a select right and then pass the data so these are the only four things that they need to pass and what it would do is that it would automatically go to the product book a ticket for you check the data if that's coming okay like a ticket id or the pdf as i mentioned and do those validations so it seems to me that it is checking things that are relatively speaking simple to check correct yes because okay. most of the time the users or, or the people do not test the simple things they want their software to do complicated stuff first right so uh does the tool because this would make it really powerful it seems to me does the tool afford the opportunity to generalize the activities on the one hand and to uh uh associate what we might anticipate to be correct uh, correct output with some other oracle it's, it's, see it seems to me the oracle that you're applying here is this worked presumably in some sense for some value of work. This worked for the developer that time, the first time. And you're using a history Oracle to say, oh, well, we got that output that time, or we got that output there, and we got that output there, and we got that output there. And therefore yeah. we're going to make an assumption that everything's okay. Yes, yes. So using a history Oracle. Yes. Okay. So it would also keep keep all the history and show you that this test ran four times with this variation of data. And this is the output that is received and everything is fine. Or if the output goes haywire, it, you know, it would say that we will fail the test, something of yeah. that sort. That's the mindset that I made that tool. I, I was never wanting that remove your testers because this tool is better. Tools are tools. <laughs> Um, they don't have brains. So it, it seems to me, and it, let me let me make l let me put a, um, a a qualifier on this. A really important qualifier. It seems to me what this tool allows you to do is shallow output checking. Now, before anybody gets all upset about the word shallow, that's not an insult. No, it's not. It's an not. Insult. The shallowness of shallow checking is a feature, not a bug, because it allows the developer to uh, make a non-disruptive evaluation, something that doesn't knock the developer off too much, that what he or she just did is reasonably close to what they intended, and it's reasonably close to what happened last time. Because yeah. if it's not like that, then you probably want to know about that. And that, uh, you know, that there's a uh, there's some value in that. Um, what always worries me about the no code, uh, uh, low code uh, mindset is not your fault. It, this is not something that, that comes out of you, I don't think. But the idea that shallow testing of, of this nature is all we need, that all we have to do is show that the product was reasonably close to what the developer intended to do, then we're good. But the developer's intentions, as I'm sure you'll agree, don't actually matter at all. <laughs> except <laughs> except uh, when uh, uh, they are consistent with the intentions of the business and the intentions of the business's customers. Now, for business, it could be some organization that's not necessarily selling stuff, but for the intentions of the people who are going to be affected by the product, uh, what the developer had in his or her wild imagination and schemings is not really that important, <laughs> except to the degree that it sufficiently addresses the task that the uh, uh, users of the product want to get done and that it doesn't introduce new problems on its own. Those things are, are really important. I, I'll tell you one more problem with no-code, low-code tools, okay? Mm. And 
people don't understand this they just want to make things faster for them but it's actually a burden to them okay i'll give you an example right I'll give an example let's assume that i used a no code low code tool what that no code tool no code low code tool would do store all the data on their server right <laughs> their specific format yes right they don't care whether they would like to spit out they just want to have that data because that is how they would increase the valuation of the tool okay so my simple question to any tool which comes on my my way is do you have a portability factor in your tool which will tomorrow give me a power to take out what i created in your tool to some other tool that's a great question that's a great yeah. question if you do not have that answer then i'm sorry i'm not going to use your tool because that would make me dependent on you each time i want to use absolutely it. not yeah. thank you very absolutely much. <laughs> You know why it took God only six days to create the world in, in the Western tr tradition anyway? No installed user base. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there wasn't any lock-in. There were no network effects, you know, nothing like that. Um, I have a, a, a another question that I would add to those who are touting the use of AI in their tools. I want to know, presumably, if there's AI, there is some kind of machine learning model that you have developed. So I want to know from those people, well, what was the data on which this machine learning was trained? Okay. How good was that data? How reliable was that data? What was the uh, a training set and what was the testing set for it? Uh, and what does it actually do? Because here's what I think is happening. The makers of these tools are using uh, a switch statements, <laughs> which is this, if you can find this element one way, uh, then uh, find it that way. And if you can't find it, try this other way. And if you can't find it, try this other way. And if you can't try find it, uh, find it, try this other way. And they call that AI which is what we used to call uh, software, <laughs> right? There's nothing AI about it, There's nothing AI about it. Uh, uh, what they're trying to say is magic, but they're leaving out the M and the G and the C, and they're just leaving the AI part after it. You know, that, that's, that's what's left. Um, but tell me about, if you're, if you're a tool vendor and you come and talk to me about your tool, I'm going to ask what was used to train whatever machine learning model might be in there. And I'll usually get crickets for an answer on that one. But if I go in deeper, I say, well, what if the uh, a data that you're using is overfit in the model to a particular training set? And the answer I'll usually get from, at least in the testing domain, is overfitting what's that uh, uh uh training data what's that so at that point you can say you know what come back when your marketing people are prepared to tell us the truth about your product and, and well, there is, there's a lot of problem i'll tell you i i recently talked about recommendation engine okay i made one recommendation engine probably i'll talk to you about some sometime later that would be cool most of the problem that exist right now and you and, and you rightly mentioned about the trading training data there is no consistency of data output if you look at it you're testing an airline software versus your trade uh, you are testing an atm versus you're testing a helicopter every output is different mm -hmm. unless and until you merge all these outputs and make a standard set right your machine learning model will never learn or or it'll learn something that's very specific to the domain i in a in a sense i'm not convinced that that's a problem 
if people remain modest about the capability of what these models can actually pull off. Um, I see no particular reason why helicopter telemetry data should be in the same form as financial transaction data, should be in the same form as a games data. I don't think that's, <coughs> that's a big deal. Uh, what is important though, is that the model and the training and the testing of the model need to be consistent with the domain in which that machine learning model is going to be placed. I mean, it, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it is the case that all you have to do is change one little rule in Go, and all of a sudden AlphaGo is going to say, what? I can't, I can't deal with this. Um, it's not, I think, <laughs> I might be exaggerating a little bit, but if, if you, if you remodel the um, uh, the uh, the tiles or the you know the the buttons or what, whatever they call them in the the go game, if you recast them as uh, a blue and red instead of white and black, <laughs> the machine learning model is going to go what I can't deal with this. Uh, humans are amazingly adaptable at that, and and machine learning algorithms aren't. There's one other thing that's really important about machine learning algorithms models and that is computationally they're phenomenally expensive and they're overfit right in, in a lot of cases they overfit the data that they were trained on and it costs an enormous amount of energy to retrain them energy and time and, and computing power and i'm not sure that uh, that turns out to be a great deal in the uh, in the end, when we could combine non-machine learning tools with clever human beings who are adaptable and uh, um, uh, can <laughs> can be retrained a lot quicker. Put it that way. Well, uh, you know, I want to share one uh, one incident here based on the conversation that you just had. So I was a part of a conference. Uh, it was during you know the first COVID lockdown, and that an online conference was going on, and it was sponsored by an AI-driven uh, testing tool vendor company, and they presented, of course, their tool during the conference, and then in the end they said, "Okay, we are open to any questions." So I asked a question saying how did you test your software was your own tool used to test your software and the response to that was oh no we had some manual testing done to <laughs> to, to confirm the functionality and uh, and and then i was like okay i i don't want to ask any further questions because i know where this is going so so this is the state of you know uh, some of the tools that are there in the market, not uh, you know taking away the 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 credit for people who are actually doing some research and are trying to actually make things work. Okay, uh, there are some some companies which are doing really good work and they are making attempts in terms of building better machine learning models and and trying to you know implement what is AI and not just simple statements. Uh, so, not taking away any credit from them, but you know, most of it that we see is is still uh, very, very, uh, you know, nascent. I, I, I would say. Oh, the lack yeah, of a better word. Sure, absolutely. Na nascent is a good word for it. Uh, yeah. It, let's face it. What does testing involve? Testing involves procedures, concept of procedures, things that, that happen. It involves coverage. That is identifying dimensions of the product that we want to observe uh, in a, uh, a means of... Um, uh, a set of perspectives by which we want to look at the product. And, you know, the, the, our 
fairly famous structure, function, data, interfaces, platform, operations, time. Those are perspectives <coughs> by which we might observe the product. And there's also evaluations that we might want to make of the product with respect to certain quality criteria, capability, reliability, usability, uh, charisma, and, and uh, uh, charm and sexiness, um, security, scalability, compatibility, performance, installability, supportability, testability, maintainability, portability, localizability. Okay, all those things are on the table. That's a coverage kind of problem. And then there's the Oracle problem. How do we know the difference between no problem observed and apparent problem observed? And it seems to me that machine learning algorithms have uh, don't have a sense of that, uh, except for a few very limited contexts. If it's output checking, Maybe the machine learning can uh, uh, algorithm can learn that. Oh, well, let's see. If we put in a ten here, and we get uh, a thousand there, and we put in a hundred here, and we get ten thousand there. If we put in a thousand here, we get a hundred thousand there. Maybe the machine learning algorithm can extrapolate on that and see what should be right. But then, will it actually note? that uh, a million would be an inappropriate input for this product. And I don't see how the, the machine learning can do that. I don't see how machine learning can uh, uh, pick up on stuff that requires social, human, customer aware, business aware, technology aware kind of questions and, and, and evaluate problem or no problem. Uh, you can get a, uh, a machine learning algorithm to figure out what's uh, what's clickable and what's not clickable. Well, that, that's great. Uh, but uh, so what? What are the implications of that uh, uh, down the way? Does this algorithm produce more data than we can possibly hope to analyze when we do that? And th these are all open questions. And they're always waved aside by the tool vendors, in my experience. That is the reason, Michael, I only stick around with uh, the recommendation which tells you that how what test to run if your code changes. That's it. Okay. Don't want to venture into, you know, because what what you mentioned is is the, the larger part of the problem, right? Because no machine learning tool will be able to predict that 10,000 is the wrong value. Okay. Because it is not even trained, right? Unless you trained your kid, they will not be able to know how to fly an aeroplane. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it's like that. So my, my research is mostly on the recommendation of the tests that you have executed previously. And now my code changed thousand lines. What tests should I run around that piece of code? I, yeah, there, there's a great opportunity for tools. It seems to me that I'm not seeing fulfilled. Now, I, I, I've not been looking particularly diligently, but if the te testing industry were healthy, they would be coming to my attention a lot more. And that is the idea that we used to, it used to be a thing of um, profilers. We get this thing from development teams and saying, oh, we must perform all the tests we've ever performed before because nobody has any idea of how this change might have affected our product Correct. and where it might have affected our product. But that seems to me really weird. First of all, why don't you know? If you don't know, that seems to me like a severity zero kind of problem, not just for testing, but for development. It, it, it basically says, well, we made a change somewhere on the aircraft, but we don't know how it's going to affect anything else. You better damn well know if it's an aircraft, how a change is going to affect it. But the other thing is, uh, there are tools that can tell you about, for instance, which components of the product <laughs> this component interacts, <laughs> interacts with. There are tools that can tell you uh, which API calls this component makes to some other component. There are tools that can tell you about what data uh, uh, this 
component affects and interacts with. That, I mean, and these kinds of tools are, from a technological standpoint, trivial. They're not a huge deal. They're, they're not uh, um, insignificant. Uh, uh, to uh, to create, but they're not really hard either. Not for skilled programmers who set out to do so. But for all those people who say we have no idea where our product might have changed, well, that would be a great implementation of tooling to identify which uh, to to map out the product and to map out what the product touches. And it used to be common, I, I, but they seem to have vanished below the radar somehow. You are absolutely correct. You know, people don't use tools. See, the major problem, right, you know, why they say that, you know, they don't know what would change is because they keep on changing. Okay, there is no, the, the person who has actually coded may left a company and there is some other person who do not have any idea. People should use these kind of small tools which would actually give them insights about how their code is looking, okay? And then it's all about correlation. That's what I believe, right? If if something ha happens here, you correlate to there and do those condition checks or whatever it is, right? Majority of the problem that is, is happening only because the tools are not there and people keeps on changing. There's no consistency in the workforce that the company has. <laughs> it's an issue it's an well issue. so so you know uh, what we can actually conclude after this long discussion is that you know if you go deeper down the path of looking at the burning questions you will see more burning questions <laughs> and 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 uh, michael i absolutely okay. agree with you that you know the only way of addressing these burning questions is when we as you know, the, the testers who have been there for some time, start educating people about testing, you know, and also guide the young younger lot in the right direction. Because a trend that I'm seeing now is, is first of all, you know, testing is not a part of the formal education system. You know, in engineering colleges, especially if I just take an example of, of, of India, uh, testing is not taught as a discipline anywhere. Okay, it's just an elective subject in probably the final semester, which can which students can easily easily skip. And most of them, they, they do. And if I go and ask them, you know, what is your, uh, you know, career aspiration? Most of them, very proudly say, oh, I want to become a developer. And I don't want to become a tester because number one, they do nothing. They just click here and there. Okay. Number two, they are not paid really well. And number three, there is not much of respect. But these are the kind of things that I get to hear from students who have had absolutely no idea, who are not a part of the industry, who have no idea what, what testing is and what development is. But they have formed an opinion based upon what has been told to them by people. So this is more of a social problem. And, and you were right. I mean, uh, we have to think it, think about it from a sociology perspective. We have to think about it from the impact that is, is getting caused. And, and, and the list just keeps on growing. And uh, it is sometimes, you know, the some of the statements that that students make or people who do not understand testing make, they are extremely hurtful. The, the remarks that are made about these manual testers, I mean, what do you do anyways? You know, look at the automation testers. They are doing all the cool stuff. I mean, does it require uh, any sort of intelligence for somebody to understand that you know, machines like Somya was also saying that machines can't think, machines can't ask questions, machines can't, uh, you know, uh, analyze the way you want to. All of this comes from a human 
who is using his or her brain and what you are calling as manual tester and just simply uh, you know putting them down and uh, have made your judgment about them it suddenly you know it it it, it pains a lot but people just don't uh, want to agree with it and they just want to go on talking about it well and you know it so much of this involves uh people's desires misplaced desires mind you but people's desires to make sure that before we release the software nobody actually ever sees or touches the product <laughs> because you know that is so disruptive it gets in the way you know the testers find a problem now we're gonna have to fix it in production instead of relying on the users to report it to us <laughs> it, you know uh, um, and but why does that happen it happens because we've got a culture of testing which is not focused on risk it's not focused on threats to the value of the product mm -hmm. that lead to threats to the value of the business instead we've got uh, armies of people saying well how do I use XPath to find this? Because my developers don't have any IDs on the and the element. It's ka. Is this is this even going to be a check that matters? Is this going to be a, a something that makes a big difference to the to the uh, to the business? Is it something that threatens the value of the product? And a lot of the time, because the checks are set up as demonstrations and not as investigations. The checks uh, uh, fail to reveal problems that are there. They fail to reveal something that's new. They're not targeted toward risk. They're targeted towards compliance, right? Confirmation, mm -hmm. reassurance. Mm -hmm. Well, I think as testers, we got to be brave and help remind people that I'm not here to provide you with quality reassurance. That's not my job. I'm here to shine light on the product so you can see it for what it is, warts and all. And if there are warts, you get to decide whether they're tolerable warts and you want to fix them or you want to uh, uh, leave them be or whether there are uh, uh, warts that are unacceptable to you. Um, but it's it's... We got into this mess. I would say it's a mess uh, because testers are insufficiently powerful and at, at the same time insufficiently uh, brave. And it's a really, it's a, I, I have an enormous amount of sympathy for young people in this business. I was lucky. I was dropped into an environment in my uh, uh, late 20s, early 30s in which the developers were eager to know about problems in their product because they work closely enough to the other people in the company to realize what those problems cost, how it affected the value of our product. We were dealing in a competitive environment and there were some tools that did exactly what our product did or, or, or pretty close to it. Our developers wanted to, uh, uh, create products that uh, did stuff far better than the others, and we were quite successful. But in order to do that, they embraced the idea that they wanted to know about problems before it's too late. A lot of testers find themselves in organizations where that is suppressed. That desire to find problems before we ship is suppressed because it's going to threaten the shipping schedule, which actually doesn't mean it's going to threaten very much at all, except somebody's bonus. <laughs> or, uh, uh, you know, oh, they talk about, oh, time to market. Well, you know, sure, you can. Why not ship now? Right? If you're worried about time to market, why not ship now? Well, because the product isn't ready. Oh, really? Okay. Well, when you think it's ready, do you know it's ready? Do you know, do you know about the problems in it? Uh, well, uh, we hope there aren't any problems. Yes, except hope is, uh, is a fine thing, but it's a terrible strategy. 
right? So uh, uh, as testers, as I say, we've got to be brave to some degree. And we've got to be able to say, I know you probably don't want to hear about problems. But I would be doing you a disservice, dear client, dear testing client, dear developer, dear manager, dear business person. I would be doing you a disservice by failing to alert you to problems that I think might matter to you and your business and to your customers. That softens the blow a little bit, it seems to me. Uh, and, and that allows us to be to be brave and, and powerful to say, I'm here to help defend value for you. I'm here to tell you about problems that would threaten your value. I'm like a, uh, 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 I was going to say a smoke alarm for the project, but actually I would say I'm, I'm here like a fire inspector. <laughs> <laughs> I, my job to snoop around your house and to identify the places where the mice might have got at the wiring, uh, where the um, uh, where there might be uh, some flammable materials that have been uh, uh, neglected, where uh, the construction of the building affords oxygen to come up and, and make a, a little fire go suddenly ragingly worse. We need to be good at doing that as a, as a culture and a community. And we old folks have to uh, help young testers do that. All right. Um, so, uh, Soumya, your final thoughts. Um, I think there are a lot of myths in the industry currently Okay, about testing, to be very frank specifically on automation. People see it very, very differently. People teach only tools. I think people should talk more about values that they can basically generate through all of these tools. Okay. Uh, I think for the young people who want to learn testing and how to program these checks, they should be I think they should be self-aware that, you know, to whom they should follow. Okay, that is another problem. Uh, there's a lot of literature and there is right literature. There is not so right in literature and there's absolutely rubbish literature. Mm -hmm. So the young guys probably should take advice, not from one person, but for a couple of persons who understand What's the right perspective for them to follow? I would say for the organizations, you know, probably they should give more time to the testers because testing requires time because you need to do a lot of experimentation. It's not about that. You just do two experimentation and you need to sign up the product. You cannot do that. Right? It's a, it's an ongoing process. It's a long process. Okay, and we need to keep on testing the, the, the product, you know, continuously. It's like that. And so we know that, you know, uh, we need to, you know, push our products faster. However, I completely agree with Michael that risk needs to be checked. Value needs to be understood what you are getting. And probably that's the last message that I will have for everyone. Nicely, well, uh, nicely done, Soumya. Very nice. Uh, Michael, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, both of you, so much for giving a lot of insights, putting some uh, of those burning questions, you know, to some degree, dousing the fire, <laughs> if, I, if I can say that. Uh, this was a simulcast on uh, YouTube and LinkedIn. So I, I am hoping that it would have reached a wider audience. Though I cannot see both screens, I, I you know. So this was our first attempt at doing that. So if this is a successful one, then we'll try many more in, in future. I hope so. And I invite people to send uh, uh, questions. Uh, LinkedIn is one place to do it, certainly. You can uh, mail me, and I'm sure some of you would. Uh, uh, offer that. And I'm not hard to find on the 
web as long as you include testing. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, you get that singer guy. <laughs> well, uh, I, uh, so I was actually going to say that that you know after this after this telecast, if you have any questions, I am uh, happy to pass them on to Michael and Somia, and uh, you can write to them directly as well. Um, you know, both Michael and Somia. I know, as, as a matter of fact, you know, are, are very happy to answer questions. They've always answered my questions. I still, I just before uh, we all leave, I just want to give an example of of how helpful Somia is. I was uh, traveling to work one day, and I was in the bus uh, about to reach my you know customer's office, and I had a question in my mind regarding uh, a. a you know, configuration for a test that uh, I was doing for a desktop application, automation configuration. And I just explained it to Soumya on the fly, on phone, with no screen sharing, nothing. And he understood and he responded. And I was able to confirm that, OK, whatever I had thought was correct. And I presented that to the customer in the next 15 minutes. And I got an OK. And I immediately called him again. And I said, OK, thank you. It was like it was like running through, you know, for some best good advice, and I got that, and so that was done. So that's how uh, we all we interact most of the time. So that's how helpful Somnia is, and Michael, I can I can tell you obviously he is always willing to answer questions, but of course you have to add testing. <laughs> if you're looking me up, yes. Yes, otherwise uh, normally, uh, you know, you get the singer. I think I think you also get uh, some of somebody tagging you in Twitter, right, uh, Michael? All the time. Uh, I've got a macro. You see, there's an application of automation. I've got a macro. I, I wrote a macroing system for Windows uh, that uses, of all things, auto hotkey uh, to to shove information at the keyboard. And uh, then I I wrote a, a system for putting stuff into a, a library of macros. Um, but one one of the early ones was uh, a macro that within a few keystrokes utters, you're thinking of at MB Sings uh, for all the uh, uh, Twitter stuff, all these Twitter uh, messages that I get telling me that how am I supposed to live without you is playing on some radio station in Nigeria. And, uh, you're thinking of at MB Singh. Well, uh, well, as as testers, it is not a wrong question, Michael. How how am I supposed to live without you? Uh, <laughs> so, anyways, thank, thank you, gentlemen, for 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 your time today. Namaste. Uh, Namaste. Thank you to the audience. Thank you for hosting us. Bye. Thank, thank you. To you. The Yes. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.